and today I'll be reading from Lord Berners' memoir, First Childhood, a chapter called Althry. When I was about six years old, my mother and I went to live in a small house called Althry on the borders of Shropshire and Wales. It was an unpretentious house, and after the spaciousness and grandeur of Arley, it seemed to me cramped and unattractive. To begin with, it had only two stories. The fact that Arley had three gave rise in my mind to an odd sort of architectural snobbishness. I considered that a house with only two stories was lacking in distinction. However, there were certain features in the surrounding scenery that had a consoling affinity with Arley. The actual situation of the house was pleasant enough. It stood on a grassy slope facing a wide expanse of meadowland, enclosed on three sides like a stadium by low, thickly wooded slopes, which reminded me of the terraces at Arley. In this arena, the River Dee, a winding, picturesque stream not unlike the Severn, made an almost complete circle, leaving in the same direction as that in which it entered, as though it had met with some geological opposition and was not going to insist. In the spring and early summer, the meadows were spangled with every kind of wild flower, cowslip, fritillary, cuckoo flower and bright marsh marigold, that edition deluxe of the common buttercup. And in the woods and hedgerows, there was a greater variety of bird life than even Arley could provide. As a child, ornithology was one of my principal hobbies. And at a very early age, I became a bird bore. On a distant hill, there stood a grey ivy clad house bearing the romantic name Gwyn Hillard. For years, this house had been uninhabited. It was beginning to fall into ruin and had required a sort of Walter de la Mer atmosphere of eeriness. The serpentine course of the river placed it beyond the range of our daily walks. And despite the curiosity the place aroused in me during the four or five years I lived at Althry, I never managed to get more closely acquainted with it. It continued to retain for me all the charm of an unreached goal. Yarrow unvisited is often the most satisfactory for the idealist. And whenever I think of that particular landscape, the forlorn grey house on the distant hill always figures as a little Valhalla of mystery and romance. We have a vision of our own. Ah, why should we undo it? At Althry, I led a rather solitary life. It is said that an only child has less fun but better fare. I know that in my youth I suffered a good deal from boredom. I occasionally met other children and I, I had several small friends in the immediate neighbourhood whom I saw fairly often. But it is in the routine of a child's life that solitude tells the daily routine. For such important functions as getting up, going to bed, meals and lessons, I had no other company than my nurse and my mother. Every afternoon after luncheon, I used to have to rest. This entailed lying on a bed in a darkened room for about one hour. At this time of the day, I always felt unusually wide awake, and I used to find this enforced suspension of my activities rather irksome. At the same time, this hour of repose was not without its charm. I was never able to sleep, and on a summer afternoon it was pleasant to lie in idleness and think of all the lovely things one could do when the siesta was over and the hour of liberation came. A pause in which one could reculer pour mieux sauter. But one afternoon, my daydreams were interrupted by an extraordinary phenomenon that took place on the ceiling. Everything that was happening outside the house within a certain radius appeared upon it, mirrored in vivid shadow play. As I lay on my bed, I could see, reproduced on the ceiling, the moving figures of servant, servants, gardeners and grooms. A dog trotted across and a cat appeared and sat licking itself. 
I saw the carriage coming up to the door and my mother going out for a drive. It was a complete cinematographic representation in silhouette. The curtains had been drawn in a certain way, which allowed a small shaft of light to penetrate, and the ceiling of the room had been converted into a cinema screen. Alas, as soon as the curtains were touched, the vision disappeared and I was never able to recapture it. Every afternoon I used to pull the curtains backwards and forwards, hoping to produce that effect once more, but I was never able to get more than a blurred picture that resembled a cinema out of focus. The clarity of the first vision was a miracle that never repeated itself. It depended I suppose, upon a very exact spacing of the curtains, the intensity of the light outside and other details of, the, of arrangement that ought to have been carried out with scientific precision. I was also a little nervous of experimenting too openly with the curtains, lest I should be detected and made to divulge my discovery. I had an instinctive objection to grown-ups getting to know about any unusual form of pleasure for fear it should be promptly condemned as immoral and forbidden. One never knew. Much of my time at Alfrey was passed in the study of bird life. My enthusiasm for ornithology had been originally aroused by the coloured illustrations in Gould's British Birds, huge volumes bound in dark green Morocco, which is a special treat I was sometimes allowed to take out of the study at Arley. For some obscure reason, birds of the swallow tribe appealed to me most of all, especially sand martins, and it was a source of sorrow to me that, although there was a sandy cliff in the neighbourhood which seemed preeminently suitable for the habitation of sand martins, not one ever built its nest there. I should have liked to have been able to boast of having sand martins' nests on the property. Finally, I was reduced to burrowing holes myself in the face of the cliff, and pointing them out to people as the genuine article. I carried on this innocent deception until one day the son of one of our neighbours, a disagreeably spry youth with a highly technical knowledge of natural history, detected the imposture and proclaimed it from the housetops. It was a horrible humiliation. I never liked him since, and I'm glad to say that he came to a bad end. Ornithology had its pitfalls and false doctrines, just like any other branch of scientific research. In an apparently authoritative book on birds written by a clergyman, not, I may say, the Vicar of Selborne, I found it stated that the tree creeper was of so sensitive and nervous a disposition that if one were to throw a stone at the tree upon which it was creeping a few feet below it, it would fall to the ground senseless. I wasted a great deal of time stalking tree creepers and throwing stones in the manner indicated, but each time the bird merely flew away and I was left feeling rather foolish. When I complained about it to my father, he said that the clerical naturalist who had recorded the phenomenon had very probably made a bad shot and hit the bird itself. Plausible as this explanation seemed to be, my faith both in clergymen and in the written word was severely shaken. The first seed of scepticism was sown in my heart. In the same book, I read that the Capacalzi during the mating season became so engrossed in its love song that you could steal up behind it while it was singing and hit it over the head with a bludgeon. This statement I never had the chance to verify. In any case, the author, in contradiction to his calling, seems to have been rather bloodthirsty in his attitude towards this feathered tribe, and it would have been just as well had he been a little more animated with the spirit of St Francis. Those who say that their childhood was the happiest period of their lives must, one suspects, have been the victims of perpetual misfortune in later years. For there is no reason to suppose that the period of childhood is inevitably happier than any other. The only thing for which children are to be envied is their exuberant vitality. This is apt to be mistaken 
for happiness. For true happiness, however, there must be a certain degree of experience. The ordinary pleasures of childhood are similar to those of a dog when it's given its dinner or taken out for a walk, a behavioristic tail wagging business. And as for childhood being carefree, I know from my own experience that black care can sit behind us even on our rocking horse. I was subject as a child to outbursts of temper so tumultuous, so unbridled as to cause those who witnessed them to expect at any moment an attack of apoplexy. I often regret that I am unable to lose my temper now in so spectacular a fashion. I have noticed that people with a reputation for violent irascibility generally succeed in getting their own way. And it is not in the least necessary for outbreaks of bad temper to have the backing of superior physical strength. The wrath of the lamb is notoriously terrible. And even the rabbit, when it stamps its foot, is alarming enough. A really good display of fury is always impressive. There is something mystical, something demonic in its quality. There is no doubt that during my early childhood, the violence of my temper was very useful in preserving me from punishment. It certainly did so on the occasion of my first and only experience of corporal chastisement. This took place when I threw my mother's spaniel out of the window. Let me hasten to assure dog lovers that this action was not inspired by innate cruelty or even by a hatred for dogs in general. It was due rather to a false association of ideas, an erroneous form of reasoning to which the human mind is particularly prone. I had heard somebody say that if you threw a dog into water, it would instinctively swim. Reflection upon this biological fact led me to wonder if a dog, when thrown into the air, would also instinctively fly. Happening to see my mother's spaniel lying near an open window on the first floor, I felt that here was a good opportunity to make the experiment. It was a fat dog, and I had some difficulty in lifting it up onto the windowsill. After giving it an encouraging pat, I pushed it off. I watched the unfortunate animal gyrating in the air, its long ringleted ears and tails spread out by centrifugal force. Incidentally, it bore a strong resemblance to Elizabeth Barrett Browning, but it appeared to be making no effort whatsoever to fly. My mother was excusably infuriated by what appeared to her to be an act of wanton cruelty although the animal had fallen unscathed into a lilac bush, and I failed to convince her of the scientific aspect of the experiment. She made up her mind to cross the educational Rubicon and to give me my first thrashing. This was the occasion on which she appealed in vain to my father. By the time she had selected a convenient implement, which happened to be a bedroom slipper, I fancy her resolution had already weakened. She set about it in a half-hearted fashion. Nevertheless, the first blow acted upon me as a spark in a powder magazine. With empurpled face, foaming at the mouth, I wrested the slipper from her hand and be began belabouring her throat and bosom with such violence that she ended up by flying in terror from the room. Flagellation having proved a failure, other methods of correction were attempted. Returning one day from a picnic, I made myself very objectionable and was put out of the pony cart and compelled to run behind it. Whereupon I gave vent to an access of fury so appalling both to the eyes and to the ears that the cart was promptly stopped and I had to be taken in again. When another offence was punished by confinement in a dark cupboard, I retaliated by locking up all the water closets and throwing the keys into a pond. As there happened to be visitors staying in the house at the time, the confusion and discomfort caused in the household can be easily imagined. The only corrections that had any real effect upon me were those of a moral nature. Curtailments of liberty or of food I merely regarded as strictly personal disputes between myself and my nurse and my mother. When, however, I was sent to Coventry, when the servants declined to speak to me, when my mother refused to kiss me goodnight, the fact that I had offended against the rules of order and decency was brought home to me far more acutely, and I was made to feel 
that I was up against the forces of convention and public opinion that keep the ordinary citizen in his proper place.